Hello and welcome to the first uh, Replace Educational Webinar of 2024. My name is Mieke van Wilders and this is my colleague Maud Everaert and together we work on the Replace project. Now we are still waiting for a few people to join the webinar. I would like to give you a bit more information on Replace. So Replace is a scientific platform where we aim to collect all available expertise that we have on alternative methods to animal
It has already also been shown that they can uh, predict the response to, for example, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so our work and also the talk of today will mainly focus on the tumor organoids themselves, um, and we're still developing assays for the assembloids and the tumor fragments. So tumor organoids, <laughs> they're quite challenging sometimes because um, the, the establishment and the growth is really patient dependent and also tumor type dependent. Short term cultures are often more successful for two, three passages, but often they, they stop dividing afterwards. So I think on average, maybe 50% of the samples uh, result in long term cultures. Um, it's also quite expensive, the medium, the supplements and so on, they cost a lot and you also need quite specialized equipment and expertise to first uh, work with these patient derived organoids, but also do analysis of these patient derived organoids. Uh, and now most of the, the papers out there use rudimentary viability assays for drug screening like cell titer glow. So for these last two uh, points, we aimed to develop actually a solution here at the university. And we established an ecosystem of the tumor organoid biobank, of course, to have access to fresh patient samples, biobanking these organoids and making them available for researchers. Um, and the second aspect is that we are now uh, have also uh, established a uh, screening platform, so really state-of-the-art automa automation infrastructure so that we can screen organoids high throughput, both with wide field imaging and confocal imaging. Um, and to handle all this data and also add to analyze all this data, we also developed uh, the Orbit's image and data analysis pipeline, which is now also a university spin-off. And we're actively looking for funding to really develop a web app where people can upload their images, do the analysis and so on. So the, the focus here was really high throughput screening. Um, so we work in 384 well plates and when you look conventionally into the papers or in literature, then you can see that ATP assays used. And for the people that don't know uh, cell type glow or ATP based assays, so conventionally you treat the organoids, incubate uh, the compounds three to seven days, then you add a buffer to lyse the cells, you measure, measure ATP, uh, and you quantify relative viability based on uh, the amount of ATP compared to an untreated control. But for us, this was. Um, uh, not really sufficient because you want more information. You don't know, for example, what happens in these first days. And you have no information at all about the type of response. Is it growth rest? Are the cells dying? Is it a homo heterogeneous response? Uh, and of course, ATP is uh, heavily affected by metabolic changes and also uh, different uh, therapies. So we now really have these complex in vitro models, but you only look at one single aspect when you use ATP based assays. And that's why we now um, or already from the beginning, we wanted to implement live cell imaging. And at the same time, I started using organoids. I also acquired a um, uh, live cell imager from uh, through a competition. And this really allows us to take high quality images of these organoids grown in three and in four well plates. Um, but then the, the image analysis was also lacking. So we developed our own image analysis and we really wanted to work label free. So now we can uh, accurately quantify the size, the count, the interaction and so on from these organoids using label free image segmentation. Um, and we still now include uh, a site or a cell that die so that we can also quantify the dead cells in the organoids. As you can see here, but these are quite viable organoids, so not all of cell dead. Um, so we're also continuously improving our software. So besides label-free detection of uh, viable organoids, we now also included label-free detection of uh, dead organoids, which uh, in our hands really enhances the, the downstream analysis of the data. <coughs> so we had our image analysis established. Uh, we can get accurate data from these images. And then we looked into drug response metrics and conventionally relative viability is used. But there's um, some downsides to using relative viability in our opinion and also in the opinion of other people, uh, because you cannot make a distinction between cytostatic and cytotoxic responses. Uh, it's very sensitive to variations in seeding density. 
um, and it's also strongly influenced by differences in growth rates between organoids or cell lines. Um, so that's why growth rate metrics are uh, have been established by other people, for example, Hefner et al. and Gupta et al., where they actually use the growth rates of these uh, cancer cell lines or organoids to uh, quantify differences in therapy response. And we applied these metrics, uh, so the GR metric, the NUR metric in-house, but when, which were actually developed for 2D cell lines. But when we uh, yeah, gathered a lot of data, we saw that they were not really adequate for our application. So we developed our own image, uh, own drug response metric, the NOGR metric, or the normalized organoid growth rate. And it requires a scan at least at time point zero and at time point X, for example, after 72 hours, five days, and so on, to um, really be able to quantify the growth rate. And from this single metric, we can plot similar dose response curves, but uh, we can get much more information from these dose response curves. As you can see here, that uh, a value between one and zero indicates a cytostatic effect, indicating that your, um, your compound at this concentration only induces growth rest. And a value between zero and uh, minus one in, uh, indicates a cytotoxic effect, so really a killing of the cancer cells. And these are some images to, to show um, the, the, the values corresponding uh, to the images. So this is the untreated control. Here around zero, you mainly see that the organoids are arrested in their growth. Um, at the negative value, you can already see much more cell deaths. And of course, at minus one, everything is 100% dead. Um, so this new uh, organoid drug response metric uh, and the validation of it uh, has been submitted. So hopefully it will be available soon for your um, review. So what we uh, also think is a very big advantage of using live cell imaging is that you can actually see what is happening in the well. So this was uh, I, quite some organoids responded, quite some cell did, but you can see a very heterogeneous response. For example, these organoids still very healthy. It uh, grew quite well. So this is clearly a resistant organoid. Um, this is an intermediate organoid where the growth was arrested. And this is an organoid that was completely dead. So indeed, the, the heterogeneity that uh, yeah, is a benefit of using organoids is also really shown in our wells when treated with certain compounds. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that the, the ratio of these resistant and sensitive clones actually corresponds very well to the progression-free survival uh, of these patients. And these were pancreatic cancer patients, for example, treated with uh, genocidabine and paclitaxel. So it's really the heterogeneity that correlates very well to the, the clinical response rather than the, the general drug response metrics. And this is also published recently in uh, Precision Oncology. So now instead of looking at a single aspect, for example, using ATP-based assays or cell type glow, we can really look at the complexity of these organoid models and really use them to their full potential. So some more information about the drug screening pipeline that we apply. Uh, this is also published in uh, Jovi. So we're really open to help if you want to implement the screening method in your own lab. Um, so the conventional way, if you know how to grow organoids, you grow them in domes. Uh, we culture them for three to four days to have already uh, mature organoids. Then we use a piping thing robot to see the organoids in a 384 well plate. And then we use a digital drug dispenser to very accurately uh, dispense different concentrations of different compounds to these wells. And then, of course, we use live cell imaging um, for taking the images and orbits for quantifying uh, and extracting data from the images. And now also Orbit is a fully automated uh, data analysis pipeline afterwards. It automatically calculates all these different metrics like the NOGR and the RGR. Uh, relative viability and so on, and also uh, at a single organoid level. So this uh, pipeline is fully automated, and we really wanted to put this new pipeline to the test. So we tested um, 
a drug, aranafine, which I used in uh, back in the days when I was still a PhD student. And it's a drug that uh, is normally used for rheumatoid arthritis. So it's a very, uh, but it has shown very much promise as an anti-cancer agent. And repurposing drugs that are already off patent is of course very cost effective because it's already clinically approved for uh, other indications and uh, there's no patents involved anymore. And the mechanism of action of aralofine is mainly through induction of oxidative stress and um, leading to cancer cell death. And in literature, there's a lot of papers and a lot of studies that show that aranafine can effectively be, effectively be combined with other anti-cancer drugs, uh, resulting in a synergistic interaction. So synergy means one plus one is three. So the, the effect of the both drugs combined is more than the expected sum, which is of course also beneficial that you uh, can use lower doses of the therapy, but get a stronger effect. Um, and in this study, we wanted to uh, resolve some questions. So is there um, tumor efficacy of aralofin and is it selective towards cancer epithelial cells? Uh, and we used healthy lung organoids in comparison. We wanted to define biomarkers for response, uh, which is of course always very useful that you can stratify patients in the future. Um, and then we want to um, identify selective and synergistic combination strategies. So we used two uh, normal epithelial lung organoids, uh, four non small cell lung cancer organoids, four PDEC organoids, and we tested 11 drug combinations uh, in a six times four drug synergy matrix so that you have a lot of different combinations of different doses of the drugs. For this, we used uh, 20 384 well plates, generated uh, almost 37,000 images and uh, one terabyte of data. So it's really a lot of data to handle. Um, and it took me, I think, it took us quite some time to really get this pipeline fully automated. Um, and now this is an old presentation, so all this data uh, and all the analysis from images to really plots can be done I think now in less than three hours so it's really very automated uh, very time saving and we also do uh, data compression up to 80 percent so we also save in uh, in data costs so some of the, the uh, as an example some of the results we got from the screening um, the, the NOGR dose response curves, of course, and we can mostly use area over the curve shown here on the right. And we can already see that the healthy organoids, uh, the two normal epithelial lung organoids, are actually the least sensitive to aranofin. Of course, good news because we want to kill the cancer cells, not the healthy cells. Uh, and for the organoids themselves, or the cancer organoids, there's quite some variability with some organoids more having a cytostatic response, some organoids a very cytotoxic response, so a lot of cell death. Um, so also part of the pipeline, we make automatic uh, grouping of the, the drug response into resistant, intermediate and sensitive organoids. Uh, as you can see here, the healthy organoids are part of the Oh, no, sorry, here at the bottom, the healthy organoids are the resistant ones, and two lung organoids are also lung cancer organoids are very sensitive. And using these classifications, but also the baseline transcriptomic data of these patients, we can apply different machine learning models to find the, the genes or the expression of the genes that uh, best groups or uh, yeah, groups the, the distinguishes the different uh, groups. So we wanted to see which gene is uh, mostly expressed in sensitive group, the resistant group, and so on. And an interesting one was uh, CA12. So in the sensitive organoids, the expression was almost absent. And in the resistant and intermediate responders, this expression was higher. And as an example, uh, this model was trained on, uh, I think, uh, eight organoids, and we left out one organoid, the PDEC087. So we know from our screening results that it says an uh, intermediate responder. So we use this to see if our decision tree makes sense. So PDEC87 has uh, low IGFL, so uh, low means that it's uh, at least a responder. And it actually has high C12 levels, so classifying as an uh, intermediate responder. 
And this is just an example to show that using baseline uh, transcriptomics, we can quite accurately identify biomarkers to classify uh, responders, non-responders, and uh, or other subgroups like we used here. Um, so the, the selectivity was proven. Uh, we found a biomarker. We also made uh, predictive signatures, so taking into account more genes. Um, and then the second step, where really the high throughput aspect uh, is beneficial, is that we can define the synergy between aranofin and a lot of different combinations. So this is the average uh, synergy, and a large bubble means synergistic interaction, a medium bubble, an additive effect, so 1 plus 1 is uh, 2. And antagonism would mean that they counteract each other, but this uh, was almost never the case. And this bubble plot not only shows the synergistic uh, or the synergism, but also um, the the the, yeah, the strength of the, the response. So a higher score means more cytotoxic, uh, really high uh, inhibition of cell growth. So a large bubble and uh, a large red bubble is a very effective combination therapy because it's very synergistic, but also very toxic. Um, and when we look at the different combination strategies, we see that NK2206 in combination with aranofin, uh, it's an actin inhibitor, is indeed very effective in the cancer organoids, but not in the healthy lung organoids. And then we can look, of course, more into depth because we performed a uh, drug synergy matrix. Uh, and again, we can see that the healthy organoids only at higher concentration, there was a strong synergistic effect and also cytotoxic effect. Um, and here it's the NOGR that is in the, the color heat map. So a value between one and zero again means more cytostatic effects so or not a lot of effects. And from zero to minus one is really a cytotoxic effect. So that's really what we want to achieve. And that's also what we achieved in um, these organoids. So these organoids are actually the intermediate responders to aranofin. So there's also more room for synergy, of course. <coughs> Uh, making that we also saw the strongest synergistic effects in this group, really pushing them towards uh, cytotoxicity. And then these organoids were initially very sensitive to aranofin, so uh, less room for synergy, but still all the bubbles are uh, almost in the red region, indicating that either aranofin as a molar therapy or still the combination therapy really can kill these cancer cells. Um, in a selective way because the normal epi lung epithelial cells were not affected. So from this uh, single screening, we really got a lot of information. We showed tumor selectivity. Um, we identified uh, single biomarkers, but also uh, predictive signatures. We also identified the most effective uh, and selective synergistic combination strategy in com uh, with the ACT inhibitor NK2206. And of course, we show that live cell imaging is a very powerful tool uh, for organoid drug screening. And this paper is now under revision. Um, so hopefully, it will also be available soon for you. Um, so this was the, the pipeline we established and also the validation that we did, looking into the metrics, uh, really applying it on high throughput drug screening data and optimizing the scripts further. And now we're, um, like I said before, actively looking for funding to make the, the image and the data analysis software available through an uh, online web app. So we really want uh, Orbits to be a platform that uh, resolves all of the struggles I had or still have uh, in the lab myself when you make, for example, an organoid biobank comes with a lot of data, so you really want to include an organoid database tool, um, then easily upload your images from a drug screening, do all the data, image and data analysis automated, offer cloud-based storage, data compression to save on the costs. Um, and in the future, we also want to integrate the, the correlations like we did here with the, the transcriptomics data, but also with the clinical data and so on. So really, a very intuitive, useful tool to not only to do 
image and data analysis, but really link these results to the clinical data and the omics data. Um, besides Orbit, um, which is now developed as a desktop application, it's, uh, which is available here at uh, University of Antwerp. And we offer this also in uh, Drug Vision AI. So it's a new university service platform uh, with state-of-the-art automation and imaging infrastructure. Today, or last week, the SI cell discovery, uh, discoverer uh, was installed. So now we also have uh, very advanced confocal imaging capabilities uh, using the Spark Cyto, uh, which all the data I showed in this presentation was generated with, uh, is also now automated. So we have a much higher capacity for screening. And we also combine it with automated liquid handlers uh, and, of course, orbits. And um, the aim is to really offer drug screenings for academia, but also industry partners using our organoid biobank. Um, so that was uh, the, the presentation I wanted to give. And of course, there's uh, a lot of people that I need to thank, a lot of people from the university hospital, the surgeons, the pathologists, uh, and also the people from my team. And if you have any questions or if you're interested in either the image and data analysis or the, the service, feel free to contact me uh, after this webinar. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe, for this nice and clear presentation. Uh, actually, I have a few small questions myself already, um, because you mentioned that you can use your system for many different uh, cell lines. But I was wondering which, with which type of cell line you have the most experience uh, in your system. Um, so we initially had the most, yeah, we have the most experience with pancreatic cancer. Yeah. Um, but now since the summer, we I think we have diff, uh, ten different tumor types: breast cancer, cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, we restart in lung organoids again. So we have a very broad panel of. Um, expertise and also organoids in the biobank. Oh, yeah, okay. And then I also had a small question on, because you mentioned you were going to validate it, so I was wondering what are the, ne the next step for that? Um, so now we mainly validate it in-house, so it's either the pipeline and the image analysis. Mm -hmm. So we're set up, trying to set up collaborations with other people um, or other groups that also will apply the method we developed to see that it's not only works in our hands, but it's robust, it also works in other people's labs. Um, and we will try to get more um, translational data where we link the ex vivo drug response to the clinical response and see um, what metrics now really are important to translate the drug response in the lab to a clinical response. Yeah. yeah, because indeed it will be very useful to have this information, especially if it were to be used by pharmaceutical companies uh, with different yeah. compounds. And I was just my final question, um, because now you focus on drugs, is it also possible to use it for different chemicals like biocides, pesticides? Um, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> pesticides. Uh, depends a little bit. We're also working with another group, uh, ophthalmologists. They, it's not organoids then, but they really want to stimulate the growth of cells, so that's also possible. But it depends a little bit on the readout. Yeah. Um, okay, then I will go to Maud because I saw we have some questions in the chat as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat, so I will go through them. So the first question is from uh, Florian van Orenbeek, uh, who is asking, um, how can you, or did you, how did you determine uh, the threshold for your decision tree with IG LF1 and CA12? Um, for that, we actually used an online tool, it's called Becomics, so the, the threshold settings are not known, but it's a very useful tool that everybody can apply. Um, saying that, we use this online tool now, but uh, in the next months, we really want to develop our own models to uh, have better um, control over the parameters, like you say, to, uh, to make these prediction models. All right. Um, so then the following question is from Emilien Nicolas on uh, um, 
how can you uh, can you apply microflight fluidics to your workflow? Um, I think it's difficult uh, because you yeah we work with the uh, two hundred eighty four well plates. So really, the high throughput aspects with microfluidics, I think, is still challenging. Mm -hmm. I know Mimeta has some organ on the chip models in high throughput 384 well formats, but it's not really microfluidics. It's more uh, passive movements of uh, of your medium. But yeah, it depends. Something will need to be developed to make it compatible with high throughput uh, aspects. Yeah. Right. Um, we, then we have another question from Cyril Corbet. Um, is the size of your organoid cultures um, compatible with the existence of gradients for oxygen, pH, and nutrients? And other, another question, um, um, is there any further, further application for metabolic studies, uh, for example, to assess metabolic heterogeneity within 3D organoids in your pipelines? Um... So I think to answer both questions, we can uh, take all these things into account. And for that, again, the life cell imaging is very powerful because you can use life cell imaging markers to really quantify, for example, the hypoxia, hypoxia state in the center of your organoid and those things. We haven't done that up to now, uh, but also for metabolic changes, I can imagine that there's uh, life cell imaging reagents available. So the combination of life cell imaging reagents with uh, the organoids could really give an answer to those questions. All right. And then finally, we have a last question um, from Stephen Gosens. Um, are organoid cultures available for other functional studies instead of uh, cell titer glow, uh, for example, uh, matrix inv invasions? Um, not in high throughput. But we, you can use the organoids indeed for invasion assays and migration assays. It's also possible. All right. Uh, in the meantime, we receive another question. I'm not sure if we yeah. have time. Um, so from Evelyn Peters, um, your system quantifies uh, using label-free methodologies, but are you also able to combine this with some specific fluorescent labels in your system? Uh, yeah, indeed. So the the label free aspect is really for the organoid segmentation, and then the region that's quantified by the label free segmentation. Within that region of the organoids, we can look at the expression of, for example, cytotoxic screen for cell death or any other fluorescent marker. Uh, in that case, so we can really link it to a specific organoids. The signal. All right. So that's it for the question. I think we can move on to the next presentation. Yeah. So thank you again, uh, Christophe, for presenting your work. So now indeed it's time for the second presentation by Dr. Uh, Colinda Schele. So uh, Colinda established her lab at the VIB Center for Cancer Biology and the Kai Leuven Department of Oncology. She pioneered unbiased lineage tracing uh, approaches, 3D whole organ imaging techniques and intravital micro microscopy uh, strategies to study the memory stem cell dynamics and also the branching morphogenesis. Her lab studies how health the tissue uh, architecture prevents or promotes the different steps of tumor genesis uh, by, by using advanced imaging approaches and organoid technology. And the tools are complemented with omics and quantitative modeling uh, to further unravel the mechanisms of tissue uh, transformation. So a topic that closely aligns with the previous talk. And I'm happy to say that Colinda received already several awards for her work. So we're also very happy that uh, she's here today to give us a bit more information on her work. So Colinda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right, welcome everybody. And also thanks for inviting me to give this webinar. Um, so today I will dive a bit more into a specific tissue, which is the breast. And I will show you how we how we have developed and try to use organoids to really recapitulate its dynamics because it's a very dynamic tissue and I will go into that a bit further in the in the presentation and how we can then use these organoids to study really the very first steps of tumor genesis. So this is what I will focus on today. Um, 
So an alternative title to my talk is, is really, what does it take to make an organ model that really resembles the, the in vivo tissue? Because of course, that's what we want to achieve in the end. Um, so it's not as applied as the previous talk, but I'll, I'll dive more into more the basic science uh, that we can also do with these organoids. So first, a little bit about the breast. Um, the breast tissue is quite a complex tissue, also dynamic tissue. Um, but the most important part uh, that we are mostly going to see today is the epithelium. And the epithelium uh, in the breast is organized into a tree-like structure, as you can see over here. And this is also really the tissue of origin uh, where breast cancer arises. Well, this epithelium is embedded in a, in a stroma. Uh, there's a lot of immune cells, fibroblasts. There are a lot of adipocytes and, of course, also an extracellular matrix. So it's definitely a very complex tissue. And what we try to do is actually take out these epithelial cells, put them in a dish and try to make them look like breast and behave like breast. So you can imagine that this is not very, very easy. Um, and what you can also see over here is that breast cancer actually can, can come in many forms. It's a very heterogeneous disease uh, going from pre-invasive lesions, which we call ductal carcinoma in situ, to invasive cancers, and they all have different characteristics and also different prognosis um, and aggressiveness. Um, so I think it's, it's clear that it's important to understand how this is uh, cancer can arise in this tissue. Now, if we compare the human breast to the mouse breast, because I also show some, some mouse organoids, you can already see that actually there are a lot of differences. So it's a similar tissue. It's also uh, memory tissue, um, but the morphology and the structure is quite uh, different. Um, so breast cancer typically arises in this, in this breast tree and how this then looks is that here you have another schematic of the breast and then uh, a nodule arises in one of these ductal trees. So here each tree has a different color and they all feed into the nipple. Now this tree is not static, it's very, very dynamic. And just to show you here, it can go through many different developmental phases. So it starts during puberty when the tree develops, the epithelial tree of the breast develops. Then in the, in the adulthood, you have cycles of growth and regression driven by the menstrual cycle. Um, then when pregnancy occurs, the tree completely transforms and now prepares to start and produce milk. Um, after that, when, when there is, uh, the lactation is, is done, um, then there's involution. So the tree regresses again to a kind of uh, pre-pregnancy state. Um, and this cycle can, of course, as we know, it can repeat a couple of times. And you can really actually uh, compare it to a real tree where the tree develops, gets leaves. So you have the seasons, the leaves can fall off again, the tree can blossom, and eventually they'll go and rest in place. Now, why is it so important to, to uh, understand these dynamics and to be able to recapitulate these dynamics in vitro, for example, in an organoid model, it's because that we know that all these different stages, um, which also coincide with different age, are actually associated with the risk to develop breast cancer. And they are thought to really be able to, for example, initiate uh, tumor formation in some cases. Um, so we know it's a very dynamic organ. It undergoes morphological and functional changes throughout life. And what we decided to do is to really try to understand this using organoid models. Um, so maybe first, very briefly on how we like to visualize uh, cells in, in the breast. And here, because we are also an imaging lab, we do a lot of microscopy. And here, I just want to highlight that classically, um, the breast is, of course, visualized in 2D. So over here, you see 2D tissue sections of a healthy breast and the diseased breast. Um, and this is high throughput, so it's understandable. And also for pathology, this is, this is the only way. Um, but what we think is for when we do more basic science is that also a lot of information is lost. So what we try to do when we, when we um, receive tissues is that we don't only make organoid models from these, but we also try to visualize these tissues in 3D to have an idea on how the tree looks, what architecture do we actually have. And for this, we use a lot of tissue clearing, um, which makes uh, it possible to see through intact tissues, quite large tissue pieces. 
Um, so we do this with lipid extraction and refractive index matching, and then you go from an image like this to an image like this. So you can really see through the tissue when you image it on a, on a convoco or a light sheet system. And now instead of these 2D planes, we can really get real insights into the structure of the tree, and eventually we can then also compare this to the actual organoids that we develop from these uh, tissues. We still do have 2D planes in these 3D images, so we can still go and even look at cellular level how this uh, uh, memory tree is organized. Okay, so um, this is kind of the background on, on why we want to study and, and the dynamics of the breast, um, because we think it really plays an important role uh, also in tumor formation. So what we thought is we need to have an organoid toolbox where we can really recapitulate all these stages. So a couple of years uh, back in the lab, uh, Larissa also came in my lab. She started a collaboration with um, a clinic here in, in Heverley, out Heverley, um, to get leftovers of memory reduction surgery, um, which is mostly for, this is from healthy donors. And what we decided to do uh, with these is that we chop them up. So you can really see here, we get a piece of healthy breast tissue. We um, chop it into smaller pieces and then uh, we make small fragments of them, which eventually um, we can even further dis dissociate and then we can plate them. Um, we keep them frozen until we can plate them in, uh, in our matrix. Um, so we also had to think of, okay, how can we culture them? And there have been several methods de uh, developed already. And what we decided to do is start with, a, with an approach where we use collagen gels, which we then detach. Um, so we see the cells inside, we detach them from the well, um, which makes them float. And what happens then is that they, they slightly contract. And when we embed these cells in these slightly contracted gel, what we observed is then these cells are, have, are actually in the right stiffness and they start to uh, make organoids that already slightly resemble uh, the breast tissue. And over here you can see they really float these gels inside uh, the medium. But what we already very quickly noticed, and, and I will not show you all the data, is that by just using collagen as a gel, it's not enough because we lost a lot of important cell types for the breast. So what we decided to do is enrich the matrix. So we don't just use collagen to make these hydrogels. We add, add carbonectin, hyaluron, and also laminin. So now we have a more complex extracellular matrix that we think already is getting closer to the real environment in the breast. Um, and when we do this and we also apply the right uh, medium, then we get structures like this that not only start to print like a the actual tree, but also um, show different uh, morphological um, and also the cellular features. But what you can also see here is that, okay, we, we start to get some kind of tree, but it's very chaotic. So somehow we still don't give the right instructions here to this uh, plant. And here the different colors, they just mark different cell types. So you, we, we see we have the different cell types, but they may not be arranged yet in the right orientation. Um, but still, we, we had now many organoid lines that, that start to grow, that start to branch, and that start to have at least the right cell types present. So what we thought we can already try to do is go to the next step and try to mimic in these small mini breasts uh, the menstrual cycle. Um, so what we know in, during the menstrual cycle is what happens is that you have small side branches that are formed um, under the influence of hormones which then also regress again. So you get small leaves on the tree, which then also disappear. So we thought, let's try to, to mimic this. Um, so over here, you can see we, we, we had to establish another uh, timeline, and I will not go into all the details. But eventually what we see is we, we get these organoid structures, which then also start to make these small blobs on the sides, which then eventually, if you remove the hormones, they also regress again. Um, what was very important to us is to see uh, if these organoids indeed also can really sense the hormones themselves, because this is of course quite important when you want to mimic a hormonal response. So here you see an example of the, the estrogen receptor, which is clearly expressed by, by these cells. 
Um, here's another example of another organoid where, again, you see the structure, bit green, and then here in magenta, you see that the progesterone looks like the organoid. So I think we have everything now to get to the next stages, um, but we still need to find what are the instructed instructions to make an organized tree and not a disorganized uh, assembly of cells. Um, so this is actually where we are now with, with the human organoids. We are currently trying to mimic pregnancy and lactation to at least see if we can push these glands to also produce milk and milk droplets. Um, but it's too early to, to show it. Uh, we have some promising results, but it's not yet uh, ready uh, to show. Um, but for this part on, on the human organoids, I think what is very important is if you really want to mimic the real breast in a dish, uh, the matrix is very important because it provides the right thickness to the right cell type. The medium components and, and factors you add to the medium are extremely important. Uh, and we re can really tweak how the gland looks and how it uh, behaves. And one very important component that we are currently not including is the adipocytes. Um, and here we have done some attempts already, but um, so far, this has not been uh, very successful. And, and just to give you an example, what medium components can do, I, I just show you here the same uh, organoids from the same donor. So here you have the control condition. And then when you give different growth factors, you can see that you really can start to change the behavior of these cells. So they are very, very responsive. And now we just need to crack the code and see what do they need at which moment in time to to really organize themselves well. Here you see co-culture with adipocytes, fat cells on the right. Um, so far, not very promising. It seems to inhibit the growth of the, of the breast organ. PDF beta inhibition, on the other hand, we get massive, massive organoids of a few uh, millimeters sometimes. We can really easily see them by eye. Um, so somehow this indeed leads to overgrowth of these actually healthy cells. Um, Eventually, what we want to do um, is once we have these organoids, that healthy organoids that resemble the different stages, is that we want to co-culture them with our tumor organoid lines that we already have established and see how together when we make these assemblies, so we make them grow together, how the different stimuli um, can inhibit or promote uh, the growth of these, uh, these cancer organoids in the healthy context. Um, for the next part, I will uh, go into uh, organoids that we established with, with mouse tissue as donor tissue, um, because there we are already much further with the development. And uh, I thought I just want to also show you how, how we can use these tissues as uh, also to really establish organoids that you can passage over multiple times. Uh, again, also re reducing the amount of animals that we use in our research. Um, so when we started this project also in the mouse organoid world, um, memory organoids were relatively simple and most of the protocols that were out there, they uh, just produced spheres. So very simple balls of cells. Um, but if you look in, in the in vivo situation, like in the human, we have a tree. So what Marika did in my lab is that she started from these spheroids um, and tried a lot of different um, matrices and growth factors um, to eventually arrive at the situation here somewhere in the middle where we now have really conditions where we can also go from simple spheres to into a tree-like structure, which is super important. Um, so I will not go again into all the details, but in the end what we found is the key is to provide the right matrix again, but then give the right stimuli and here we give alternating FGF and EDF stimuli, which then um, induces this branching behavior in the memory organoids. And now when we compare these organoids with the real in vivo memory gland of the mouse, you can see that they are very much resemble uh, the in vivo situation. Um, we did a lot of benchmarking, so we looked at, at, at branches, how they look, how they, how they behave, how much they elongate, uh, the branch angle and all the time you see here in vivo on the left, in vitro on the right. And you can see that actually in many cases we cannot really discriminate the in vitro model from the in vivo model. So we are very happy and we think we are really arriving at a very, at least morphologically, 
at, at a model that, that resembles the in vitro circulation. Um, so with this as a starting point, I would say we would be up here in the post-pubertal band, so we have a tree now. We also started to model these different um, cycle stages. So the first one would be um, the estrus cycle. So this is the menstrual cycle in humans. And um, the first thing for us, what was very important is to check, okay, do we have this proper bilayer of cells and do we have a lumen? So do they actually make hollow tubes? And indeed, we can see that we get very nicely these lumens. Um, and the second um, part, which I was expecting, but is not coming at the moment. The second part of what they checked is that also, again, they are able to sense hormones. So we checked if they express um, estrogen or progesterone, etc. And they also do in our hands. Um, so when we stimulate these then with uh, uh, hormones, what we can indeed see is that now side branches are forming. And when we look into proliferation, we can really see that the proliferation is occurring in these side branches. So again, we have a response to the hormones, we get side branches um, when we stimulate with estrogen and progesterone, which then also regress again when we remove these, which is exactly what happens uh, in the in vivo situation when there's no pregnancy occurring. So now when we had this, um, the next step is to look into the pregnancy. So we stimulated again these hormone sensing organoids um, to pregnancy hormones. And also there we saw a very nice response where um, the hormone sensing cells, they instructed their neighbors to make these large, um, quite dense uh, side branches that grew and differentiated and started to produce here uh, milk droplets, which we detect here in the uh, form of lipids. Um, so here you see the timeline, just to give you an idea. So you see these cells, you first go through the branching protocol, then you mimic an ester cycle, then you go in the pregnancy state, the lactation state where the milk droplets are produced, and then we have an involution state where again the the organoids or the gland regresses. So I think with the um, with the mouse organoids, we are now really able to go through all these different stages of, of, of the life of a memory gland, um, which sets us actually now at a position to study how oncogenic cells are stimulated or responding to all these uh, different stimuli. Uh, here's just a movie to show you how this looks. So we give you the pregnancy hormones, the cell gland starts to lactate. It's just a white field, so we can't see what is actually happening. Uh, and then we involute again, so the gland regresses again to the normal state. Um, some more images just to show you here again the in red. The, the production of the lipid droplets when we produce the or when we stimulate them with lactation medium compared to a control where this does not happen. Um, and also we can see that these lipid droplets, when they are made by the cells, they also secrete it into the surrounding. So they really produce very, very small quantities of, of milk, although we don't know whether the all the components um, are already present. Um, so now we have this ester cycle, we can mimic all the remodeling and the pregnancy in the dish. Um, and now I just want to give you three examples, very short, very brief, on how we can now model tumor initiation in these organoids. Um, so first I will give you an example here with mutation one. Uh, the details are not that important, uh, but just to illustrate the principle. So over here we have a spheroid. So at the very beginning of the experiment, where the wild type cells, so the healthy cells, are here in green, and now the mutant cells are depicted in red. So we have a nice mixture. Um, when we start now to branch this organoid, so we give growth hormones to to make them grow. What we can see is that the mutant cells, they are really the ones that are benefiting from these signals, and they completely take over. Uh, the culture and what we also see is that they actively eliminate the wild type cells. So they really outcompete them, eliminate, eliminate them, and then make a large brown structure. But what they can do is they can make quite an organized structure. So these cells they are mutant, but they still need they still seem to know what they should do. Now if we take another mutation, here's mutation two. Again, we make a mixed organoid. Now we have three colors, so blue and green are again 
wild type, red is mutant. And now when we make them branch, nothing happens. So you see that they even have a disadvantage, these mutant cells, these oncogenic cells. Um, so during the, the growth phase, it seems that there is not the right signals for these mutant cells to take over and you know, transform the gland. Now, when we go to the next phase and we give them hormonal stimulation, in this case with estradiol, which should promote the side branching, now we see a difference. So the red cells, the mutant cells, they take over, they start to accumulate in these kind of side buds that are forming, and they take even along the wild type cells, as you can see over here, in forming these very invasive strands. So now we know that in this case, this is a PIK3CA mutation. In this case, the PIK3CA cells, they really need a hormonal stimulus to transform and to start to show this oncogenic behavior. Um, as a first, a third example, um, again here, mutant cells in red, wild type cells in yellow and blue. When we in, induce the branching, we see that they have a slight advantage, but they do not yet completely take over the gland. And now when we start to um, go even to the next step and stimulate these cells with lactation medium, so we give them the stimuli that normally would, would transform um, or actually differentiate the gland into lactating state. Now we see that these mutant cells, they start to benefit from these signals and then really start to make these aberrant structures, uh, including these bulging uh, ducts. So, can breast organoids already replace the in vivo tissue context and dynamics? I think we already got quite far. And, and just showing you these examples, I think we, we are very close and really mimicking all the different stages, which we can now really use to start and model the very first steps of tumor initiation in, in these models. As you could see, the, the mouse organoids are already a couple of steps ahead of the human organoids and, and one of the reasons for this is also the limitation of material so we are very happy with, with our collaboration with the, with the clinic with the, um, the plastic surgeon um, but in general this is really a hurdle to overcome to be able to obtain the right tissues um, to build this model which is unfortunately uh, not always very easy even if you're next to a, a big hospital um, so with this, I would like to end. So today I showed you some work of Larissa, who is playing the drums on the right. Uh, Marika here in pink did the mouse uh, study. And of course, we are very thankful also to Wim, the Martellara, uh, who is kindly providing us the tissues of the healthy donors. And of course, also the women who kindly provide their healthy breast tissue for our research. Uh, and with that, I will end and I'm happy to take uh, questions. So thank you very much, Colinda, for your nice presentation. I really liked the video of your <laughs> breast organoid with the involution. It was very nice to see. I'm also already very curious to the results of the production of your milk droplets and the composition of the, of the fluid in fact. I actually had uh, one small question because you mentioned that you were already thinking to incorporate the hormone and adipose tissue. So I was wondering if you have any concrete ideas on that yet, like for example, would you have a link with thyroid function or something like that? Hey, can you say repeat the last part? A uh, link with what? Uh, the thyroid, the skilled clear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we, it's very, very early days. So what currently what we are doing is we are also isolating the adipocytes from the healthy tissue donors. Um, and we um, try to embed these cells then in, in, the, um, in the matrix. Um, together with the with the epithelial cells. And we see that these adipocytes, they actually survive. They, they stay there, they stay adipocytes in most of the cases. Um, some of them that are not well trapped in the matrix, they actually, because they float, so they just float in the medium, like, like a balloon, you know? Um, but but I think we, we are not sure if these adipocytes at, in the gel are, we don't know what they secrete. And at the moment, I think they probably are so stressed that they may secrete factors that actually inhibit the growth of our organoids. The idea would be, of course, that they would promote uh, the organization and the growth. And till now, um, yeah, we haven't really seen benefits from these uh, adipocytes in the proximity yet. But ideally, they are very abundant in healthy breast tissue. 
uh, and we know they secrete a lot of factors locally. Um, mm -hmm. So still, I think it's an important component to the, that we should try to incorporate in our organs. Yeah, indeed. Okay, thank you very much for your reply, uh, Modes. I'm not sure if we received other questions in the chat. Uh, no, no, we don't have any questions from the chat. All right. So thank you again. Uh, ah, one last question <laughs> from the top. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, the question is, how do you define the right growth factors for each step and uh, in the differ differentiation? And what microscopy um, technology do you use? Is it confocal or light sheet? Um, so for the growth factors, this is actually based on just literature research. So we, we, we know a lot of factors that are important for, for breast development, breast differentiation, and then it's just trial and error because um, yeah, we don't really know what these organoids need and what we need to supplement. Um, so, so far we have just defined medias, media that kind of recapitulate what we think recapitulate the state. So we have the menstrual cycle, different stages, the, the pregnancy, the lactation. Um, and then the readout is just to see what the organoids do and if they then resemble the in vitro uh, situation. So it, it's, it's quite laborious, uh, but there's no way to predict what the organoids uh, will do. So I think this is the only way we can do it. Um, for the imaging technology, it's mostly confocal um, for now, um, because we don't have a, a light sheet nearby, but <laughs> it may change in the near future. And I think then we will hopefully move to a light sheet because it's faster and we can also do more live imaging. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's it for the questions. All right. So uh, another big thanks uh, to you, Kalinda, for your nice presentation. And of course, also to you, Christoph. Uh, also to you all participants uh, for being here and for participating to our webinar. Uh, we can already say that uh, our next webinar will be on the 26th of March, also on a Thursday from 4 to 5, where we will zoom in on uh, NAMS in ecotoxicology. So already save the date. We will uh, launch the, annou the announcements soon. So again, if you would like to have a certificate of attendance, please put your name and email address in the chat and we will provide it to you. And um, if you close um, the, if you wait a bit after we close the WebEx, uh, you will also receive an automatic survey. So don't hesitate if you want to propose some topics for future webinars or if you would like to present yourself. And also, I kindly invite you to register for our newsletter uh, by uh, going to the footer of our website, www.replace.be. And also there is a hyphen between the re and the place. So again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for being here. And of course, the biggest thanks to our two speakers today. And we hope to see you soon in March. Bye.